With little warning, and under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, Iraqi forces invaded the oil-rich country of Kuwait. It took less than 48 hours for his militia to totally annex the country. Uh, we see in the news that, that Iraq invaded Kuwait and took it as its uh, 19th province, if you will. And then it was clear uh, shortly after Saddam uh, entered Kuwait that an international coalition led by the United States was going to be formed. Fearing that its oil-rich fields would be the Iraqi army's next objective, Saudi King Fayyad agreed on August 6 to accept the U.S. military assistance. Operation Desert Shield began with the U.S. order to deploy its air, ground, and sea forces to the region. Among them, the 101st Airborne Division was sent to help defend the Saudis against a possible Iraqi attack. The U.S. Army moved the equivalent of the population of the city of Atlanta more than 8,000 miles to Saudi Arabia, as well as unloading 500 ships and 9,000 aircraft. Through the urging of U.S. President George H.W. Bush and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, an international effort took shape. On January 17, 1991, Task Force Normandy, a joint U.S. Army Air Force strike team consisting of a dozen helicopters, penetrated Iraqi airspace flying at a low level, nap of the earth altitude, just 50 feet above the ground, to avoid being detected by targets they were sent to destroy. On their final approach, they identified two early warning radar sites in the distance located about 435 miles inside Iraqi territory. At precisely 2.38 a.m., it was 101st two teams of four Apaches, led by then Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cody, who fired the first shots of the war. For coalition jets to be successful during the opening salvos of the Gulf War, two radar sites had to be eliminated. Over steady. Once this goes down, we've basically uh, rendered the uh, radar site ineffective and uh, out for many days. And then all of a sudden they start hitting. And when they start hitting, it's, things start exploding pretty quickly, especially when we hit the, uh, where the generators and all the fuel was. Cody's successful mission destroyed two radar sites, opening a 20-mile wide attack corridor for coalition forces. The soldiers were poised along a line that stretched from the Persian Gulf westward. 300 miles into the desert. At 7.05 a.m., then Major General J.H. Pickford P. III received word for the 18th Airborne Corps to attack. The early morning hours of G-Day, the start of the offensive to retake Kuwait, and standing tall with a superb command team and the finest subordinate commanders and staff as hundreds and hundreds of helicopters and thousands of soldiers of our division huddled in small formations ready to strike. The fog lay heavy on the desert floor and the weather on flight routes and landing zones and enemy locations was very uncertain. And when the order was given, our troops rose up with elan and pride and packed into the choppers, loaded vehicles and attacked deep, deep into the Euphrates Valley. I was in 1st Brigade, 327, for the uh, the Desert Storm. I was a young sergeant at that time, a uh, young infantryman. And just imagine, you know, 300 plus aircraft slowly rising, you know, like 10, 20, and then about 50 feet off the ground. And it seemed like we hovered for a long time, and then we st slowly started moving forward. Uh, that was a significant accomplishment. So hundreds of helicopters lifted us up near simultaneously and put us in the FOP Cobra about 150 kilometers inside of Iraq. And then 
Um, there was an Iraqi battalion defending that area, quickly overwhelmed them, secured that area, and from there, the division was able to launch to Viper to the east and then ultimately to the Euphrates River Valley to the north. Ferrying the 101st troops and equipment into the objective area, forward operating base Cobra became one of the largest helicopter-borne operations in military history. At the direction of the division staff, we planned and executed the lead air assault into FOB Cobra the first morning of the ground war. We captured the better part of a battalion of Iraqi soldiers and began to establish FOB Cobra, which in that was whole point of that was to do sufficient fueling so they could do the next air assault up into the Euphrates River Valley. You know, the Iraqi army at the time wasn't necessarily a good army, but it was a very big army. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Wasn't necessarily a quality army, but they had a, a, a huge number of tanks and armored personnel vehicles, uh, and the Apaches of the 101st were a key part of all that. According to General P, as part of that first lift of 66 Black Hawks and 30 Chinooks, we established and secured FOB Cobra, a base of critical tactical and operational importance. As soon as the 101st secured Cobra, a point some 110 miles into Iraq and refueled the choppers, it continued its jump north. My first time in combat in Desert Storm, I was really just focused on what I needed to do to lead my squad, uh, you know, to our first, uh, from our, where we landed uh, at Cobra up to our security position, which is, you know, doing it, just trying to do everything right. By mid-February, the coalition forces had shifted the focus of their air attacks toward Iraqi ground forces in Kuwait and Southern Iraq. A massive Allied ground offensive Operation Desert Sabre was launched on February 24th, with troops heading from northeastern Saudi Arabia into Kuwait and southern Iraq. Combining the eyes of Special Forces soldiers on the ground with Air Force firepower proved most effective. Everybody went in really the 24th, 5th of February or so. First Brigade went in the 24th of February, and we held Cobra, defended Cobra, because operations were emanating from Cobra. Um, you know, we stockpiled a lot of fuel, a lot of ammunition for the Apaches. They would refuel, rearm there, and then strike the Iraqis coming out of Kuwait uh, up to the north and to the east. The 3rd Brigade followed the next day, air assaulting directly over forward operating base Cobra, and we established uh, area of operations Eagle in the Euphrates River Valley, and we cut Highway 8 so that there was no traffic moving from west to east along Highway 8 into Kuwait or moving from Kuwait from east to west out of there toward Baghdad. My 1st Battalion, the 3rd Battalion, and the 1st of 327 out of the 1st Brigade were going to go up with me as we secure FOB Viper, which was going to be used to launch further operations toward Basra. FOB Viper was used as a staging base for attack aviation assets, the Aviation Brigade plus the 12th Combat Aviation Brigade out of Europe. And then that task force planned for the air assault, uh, next air assault into the Basra area. I had the 1st Battalion 502nd, the 3rd Battalion 502nd, and the 2nd of 327 Infantry air assault into, into this airfield. General Shelton came in uh, with his CP there, and then basically on 28 February, coalition forces were ordered to cease fire. After 42 days of relentless attacks by coalition forces, a ceasefire was declared on February 28th. The Iraqi army surrendered and Kuwait was liberated. Operation Desert Storm was won. Aggression is defeated. The war is over. Coalition forces had achieved one of the most dramatic victories in the history, liberating Kuwait destroying Iraqi offensive capabilities and achieving coalition strategic goals. Proudly, the Screaming Eagles, as well as the 5th Special Forces Group and the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment had etched another historic mark in American history. In celebration of the great military contributions of the Fort Campbell soldiers, the Fort Campbell Historical Foundation is poised to bring a long-awaited dream of the Tennessee Wings of Liberty Museum to fruition. 
Thanks to philanthropic support through a public-private partnership, phase one of the museum will begin in 2025. We are proud to build a home that tells the history of three of the most storied combat units in military history. How thankful I am to have been given the opportunity, the great fortune, to soldier side by side with these great Americans who were willing and ready to make the ultimate sacrifice for our nation and for the ideals that we seek to protect. The 101st Airborne Division will always be, in my mind, a national treasure. I've, from the day I was commissioned, I wore the Screaming Eagle patch on one shoulder or the other um, every single day that I was in uniform, and I'm uh, just really proud of it. It's a great unit. It's got a great history and legacy. This museum's going to capture that and have it available for everybody to, to draw strength and, and to learn from. And I'm just really honored to be a part of uh, the foundation that's putting that together.